Hello, Nacho. Hey, hi, <laughs> Janet. How are you? I'm good. So I've come to find out a little bit more about the research that you're working on at the moment. I'm working on a project uh, dealing with an, uh, a feature, an anatomical feature in our, uh, our brain called the blood-brain barrier. Right. And I, I, I hope to convince you why it is such a fascinating topic to uh, do research on. So basically, my main interest is on the blood vessels of the brain and the spinal cord. Right. And these are very different from everywhere else in the, in the body. For example, if we kind of like get all your blood vessels in the brain uh, uh, and we take them out of you and we put them line up, mm -hmm. they will go from just your brain from here to Glasgow, Good around little. 400 miles. So, and this is a perfect system that actually keeps the environment of the brain uh, at very constant uh, parameters right. so that is ne that are necessary for the electrical conduction of the nerve cells okay so if uh, you have a very stable environment okay the nerve cells will work properly if you have uh, uh, an environment that is subject to fluctua fluctuations mm -hmm. that you get in the blood, so the nerve cells won't work as well, electrically speaking. So what causes a fluctuation in the environment then, in the, in the blood that serves the brain? Yeah, what happens is that the blood, uh, blood vessels of the brain, they are very um, tightly joined together, mm -hmm. unlike those of the other organs, to maintain this stable environment they form what we call tight junctions between them. Right. So they form a barrier to the passage of molecules from the blood into the brain. But don't get me wrong, it's not a barrier that nothing steps through it. Mm -hmm. It's like a castle in which there were doors in which certain molecules could go in through the gates, if right. you know what I mean, but most unwanted uh, uh, molecules remain outside. Right. And uh, the problems that we have with these blood vessels, um, they uh, uh, come in diseases like immune diseases, like multiple sclerosis. Right. Also, when you get infections, these blood vessels become leaky and they allow the passage of immune cells into the brain. But that's good, isn't it? Immune that cells? Is, that is good whenever you have an infection to get it clear, mm. cleared. But it's not good whenever you don't have an infection or when it lasts for too long or is too large the response, like it happens in multiple sclerosis. Oh, okay. Other diseases that you may not think as an inflammatory disease may actually may have inflammation that makes the symptoms worse. Mm. And one of such diseases, I'm sure you have heard of it, is Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So in those, you get leakiness of the blood vessels and passage of immune cells that normally you don't get in such uh, large quantities. So is your research trying to stop this leakiness then? Yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to do is to understand the molecular mechanisms by which this leakiness happens in many diseases mm -hmm. of the brain and the spinal cord so that if we understand how these blood vessels malfunc malfunction, we will be able to devise a therapy that will seal them back again and, and return them to normal, right. uh, 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 to their normal function. That's fantastic. So it could really help people with multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease, exactly. which is ever increasing in the population. Exactly, exactly. So uh, specifically for those two cohorts of, of people, but also people that get infections like uh, meningitis. Right. How the bacteria gets into the brain is something that uh, we are researching on too. HIV, how HIV gets into the brain, and many other uh, either viruses or bacteria that can enter the brain, or parasites even, like malaria, mm. that can enter the brain and damage it. So things like um, HIV, you know, are very, very dangerous. I mean, do you have lab facilities here where you work with such dangerous things as that? And wh what does it involve? What kind of clothing do you have to wear or lab facilities do you need? Yeah, we, uh, here at the OU we have a tissue culture lab that we call a containment level 3 lab. Right. Those are for infectious pathogens such as HIV but also tuberculosis, 
mm. or other pathogens like that. In those cases, those labs, they have what we call negative pressure. So the air goes in, it doesn't let any of the nasties go out. Right. And you have to get dressed up in a certain manner so that you protect yourself from becoming infected. This is to say that normally this doesn't, wouldn't happen mm -hmm. normally to get infected because uh, uh, in a lab setting because we take a lot of precautions in that way. Can you tell me about some of the equipment that you use and how you actually do the research on the leakiness between the blood-brain right, barrier? Right. Um, I can actually uh, tell you about an experiment that we're planning at present. Uh, uh, what we're trying to do is to use uh, the cells that form the blood vessels of mm -hmm. the brain. We culture them in special chambers uh, so that the cells grow on them and they form you can call them artificial blood vessels. Okay. Then what we do is then put them under the microscope, attach them to two pumps, and pass uh, uh, some artificial culture medium that mimics the blood. Like a fluid? Like a fluid, mm -hmm. yeah. With immune cells going through it. So that we can study and investigate in real time the interactions between the cells of the immune system and the cells that form the blood vessels of the brain. Then we study things like, if we put them in the, under inflammatory conditions, how many more of these cells actually get stuck, of the immune cells get stuck to the endothelial cells, they're called. And uh, also, once they are stuck, do they move around? Do they try to find areas which are supposed to be weaker of the barrier and go through it? This, those are the kind of questions that we're asking ourselves at present. And is that all done under a microscope or something like that? Yeah, that is done. Obviously, these are very minute cells mm -hmm. that you cannot see with the naked eye. So it has to be in a microscope, uh, microscope called a time-lapse inverted microscope. Like a time-lapse camera? Like a time-lapse camera in which we actually uh, pick up images at certain intervals of time and then construct a film with those images to see how the cells move on top of each other. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So what's the ultimate hope or ambition for your research then? My ultimate hope is that we actually find out about molecular targets that can be used to cure these diseases. Or, if not cure, at least to ameliorate some of the symptoms. This is my <coughs> ultimate goal of, uh, of my research. Uh, it is more complicated than that because not all, uh, once you identify the molecular targets, then you need to create a drug yeah. to try to stop those molecular targets. How far down the line do you think it might be? Uh, that's the question that everybody <laughs> asks. Uh, I would say uh, <coughs> we are not there yet, but we are actually running very fast at present. Fantastic, and you're hopeful of reaching the finishing line? Uh, in time, yes. <laughs> yes, we are.